Okay, we'll go ahead and get you started. I apologize for the delay. My name is Jason Plum. I am the presenter for the day. I will be giving a talk, obviously, on called the Slice of Pie, covering basically what is a Raspberry Pi, what you can do with it, and why you might want to do some of those things. Now, we will have a, a split going on here with the presentation, so I apologize if the video flips back and forth. A little quick intro about who I am. I'm a developer and a te technology enthusiast, first and foremost. I love playing with tech. I love making new stuff with tech. By heart, through my time, you can call me nothing other than a hacker and not in the media transformed way, in the correct way, I make stuff with tech. Big difference from some guy trying to steal credit cards. So please don't mix those up. I am currently a core developer with Arch Linux Arm, and I have been since 2010, long before Pi came into existence. Let's set up a couple of pieces of groundwork real quick. What is an ARM? That's the processor that you have on your Raspberry Pis if you have one. If you don't have one, these are called ARM because they are Acorn RISC machines. And I'm not going to go into the great lengthy details of where the name came from, but I'll put it this way. There was a time that came in technology where the Intel-based processors, the x86 family, were just getting bigger and bigger and bigger, having what they call a complete instruction set. Acorn was formed and decided to make a reduced instruction set based and targeted to be high, highly efficient and low power. They do not make processors at this time. Instead, they sell the IP to be able to make the processors that they have designed. There are several generations that Arch Linux ARM specifically supports. Basically, any of the ARMs that happen to have a memory management unit or an MMU. For those that are publicly available right now, those are version 5, version 6, and version 7. The Raspberry Pi happens to be a version 6. There's a wide range of features that you can find on all the different ARM boards that are out there. If you're going to play with one, the Raspberry Pi is a great place to start because it's cheap, it's approachable, and it's not a little black box you'll never figure out what's inside. Key things that you have on the Raspberry Pi is that you have a network, you have video, you have audio, and while this does not have CAN, you can use that set of pins on the side for GPIO, SPI, I2C to connect all those additional peripherals. Now, aside from the Pi, there are many, many different implementations of version 5, version 6, version 7, and the oncoming version 8, all made by various people. You have Marvell, Broadcom, Apple, for example, all of their smartphones, like the one right there taking a picture, is based on ARM, and everybody is implemented slightly different. <coughs> what I would like to point out when it comes to the Pi is, yes, the Raspberry Pi is indeed awesome. The reason for that is it was designed to be a teaching and learning tool. All right. No, it wasn't meant for you and me directly. It was created out of need by a professor. He noticed that his incoming students were not having the skills that he had when he grew up, he grew up because he did not have kids that were exposed to raw electronics, finding out what they're really made of. Where did the computer come from? He and his generation, and even into my generation, we got to play with the parts. If you wanted to have a computer, you had to put it together, or you had to pay an exorbitant amount of money. Now computers are cheap. They come in sealed boxes. You buy one from Apple, and you literally are not allowed to open the thing at all. Now kids think that it's a magic black box called a computer that does stuff. Well, Raspberry Pi Foundation was formed specifically to create this board 
And this board is meant to specifically teach people and kids this is what a computer is. It may not have all the bells and whistles and be the fastest thing in the world, but it's cheap, it's affordable, and every school can pick them up for cheap and fill out a lab. That's what it was made for. Yes, it's very powerful. In comparison to the things around it, if you are saying, oh, well, the Raspberry Pi can do all this stuff that the Arduino does. Yes. You're right, it can. Because it's got many of the same features. And it has a much more powerful processor on it. However, take your Raspberry Pi, pull out whatever smartphone you have in your pocket, and I will bet you your smartphone will kick its butt. Because your smartphone at this point is one of the version 7 generations and these iterations are large jumps. So it's the same thing as taking the computer from 1995, stacking it against one from 2005, and going, wow, that looks faster. It's literally that kind of difference. Now, key point here that I want to point out, although I am talking about the Raspberry Pi, is there are many other development boards out there. If you are someone who's creating a project, and it's not your first one, and you need to use what you think to be a more powerful source than an Arduino, or don't want to hook up a full-size x86, please look into the other development boards that are out there. There's a lot of things you can do with these, and the development boards are extremely powerful. A lot of people then come to me and go, why is it such a success? All right, think about this. When they originally did this, the foundation expected that over the lifetime of the project, they might fill out 10,000 units. <laughs> All right. Just a couple of weeks ago, they crossed the million boundary. And the orders are still stacked. When they made the production units and they put them up for sale, they literally crashed all of the host servers from every distributor because they couldn't handle the load for orders. The reason for that is word got out. I'm building this thing, and it'll have this and this and this, and it'll be credit card size, and some people thought, oh, it's a little Linux computer. I can actually like approach. Or I can do this, and hey, I think maybe that has some of the similar things that an Arduino has. I've heard of those things before. And makers hackers, small project tools, all came up and they asked, can we do this? And of course, it even comes around and goes, well, yeah. And you had a firestorm happen. And that's how it goes. Because it's cheap, they're not selling these things for a profit. All right? It's a foundation. It's a nonprofit organization. It's designed to produce a tool that is used to teach. <coughs> However, let me cover a couple of things about this. While I say it's powerful, I say it's awesome, and that there's a lot of stuff you can do with it, please let's not be silly about this. It's a mobile processor. It's a repurposed cell phone processor, and it's not the latest generation. It's capable, it's cheap, and it's something they can get at mass. All right? It was designed to work in a wide variety of environments, which means hot, cold, reasonable amounts of humidity, and also reasonable amounts of aridity. That means you can run it at freezing in Fahrenheit, and you can run it at upwards of 80 degrees Celsius. The thermal tolerance on this is higher than you're going to be able to get it without exposing it to direct sunlight or an oven. So, with that in mind, also keep in mind that this is a development board and it's being developed still. Video libraries, the drivers for some of the buses are being enhanced. There are known issues people don't like right now. It doesn't support NKE or whatever. They're working on it. Some of those are proprietary licenses and you can buy them from the Raspberry Pi store and apply them to your board for a relatively low cost. A recent addition is all of Aug, Fiora, and Boris will be added in the next firmware update. But there are other ones they're still working on. USB is a known issue. 
there's problems with framing, there's problems with too many high-speed devices, and various other things. That's one of those little tweaks that people don't realize takes a lot of work because you're taking a high-speed bus and putting a whole bunch of things on it and then trying to make them all communicate in order all the time perfectly. Not as easy as it seems. Now, one of the things I want to point out is people with heat sinks, I'm sorry if you think it's really hot. They were designed to be operable upwards of 90 C for very short periods. The turbo mode that was introduced a couple of months ago will automatically start slowing the processor down if you hit 80 degrees Celsius. Well, we did a little research and we dug around and we load tested these guys and I even checked with even. If you look at the picture I have over the top, you will see that the hottest parts of the board are obviously power distribution, the CPU, and the USB core controller, none of which get anywhere near 80 or 90. You're not going to have a problem. So if you put a heat sink on this thing and all those little chips, all you've done is put a mohawk on your helmet because it looks nice. <laughs> there we are. Now, I will give you a couple of quick comparisons. Yes, there are games you can play that are kind of amazing from a little piece of hardware it is. You're not going to get Crisis 3. Sorry, it's just not going to happen. You will, however, get high frame rate very playable at high resolution Quake 3. You're not going to get the horsepower that you get out of an Intel Core i7 or one of the brand new AMD pile driver chips. It's a different family and it's not that new of a generation. You will, however, get a capable chip that's not locked inside of a black box. The last thing is you're not going to do any massive computing on these things. Again, they just don't have the horsepower. And if you chain 100 of them together, yes, you can technically make a large distributed system. However, one made out of Legos is not going to compare to a Cray. It's just not going to happen. It's very nifty, and it's a great teaching tool, but it's not going to have that kind of horsepower. Let's go ahead and get over to the hardware. As we look at this, you can see all of the items that are a part of the board. And if anybody else has already done their research, they know what's on the board. You have audio, video, Ethernet, HDMI, you have RCA video, and you have an 8mm audio jack. That will cover basically all of your needs. And every distribution out there that runs on the Pi will automatically detect whether you have an HDMI monitor, or you have an RCA monitor attached. The reason they included RCA is because everybody can find a monitor somewhere or an old TV that you can plug this into. And with that, it becomes approachable even for the most extreme conditions for school students. Whether that's in Africa, you can find at least one TV that four or five, 10, 15 students can share that's got an S-video in or an RCA video in. For those of us that happen to be in first world nations, we have the benefit of having HDMI every which way we look, but not everybody is and has that luxury. Have Ethernet on these guys. It is 100 megabit Ethernet maximum, but please remember it's attached over the USB bus, which means everything else you plug in, your hard drives, USB mice, Wi Fi, everything else will add to the load, so be aware, the more you apply and the more you do over the USB bus, you're going to slow down your network and you're going to slow down your hard drives if you do it all at once. GPIO pin that you see on the side. This is the handy part, and this is the key thing of interest for people in the maker space and the hacker space, because you can use those 
pins, which are laid out and configurable with GPIO, they have serial, they have SPI, I squared C. All of these buses can be pulled out with connectors from both Adifer and Olamex. I have the Olamex RPI UX right here. Um, I have an Adifer, I however left it at home, so I apologize. <laughs> These guys, for example, can be used to pick up a relay that's controlled over I2C and SPI. So I can control several lights, a couple of motors, etc., just like that. And there are many other modules that are out there that you can use. Christian, yeah. you did mention you did not mention analog. It does not natively have analog I.O. because it is a fully digital processor. You can, however, take a I2C or an SPI connection and get a plate, as they're calling them, device, and use that. They're out there, they're used competitively. You can even, if you really wanted to, hook up a Pi to an Arduino's work and connect it to it. It's been done several times. Exactly. The new Dirkboard just got released two days ago, which has the, the mention was of the GERT board. Uh, there's a new revision that comes out just in the recent days and covers things like analog, a bunch of GPIO spread outs, and the various buses broken out into a larger area that you can work with. Uh, I believe that's also made in the UK. Yes, you're right. Because he works with Foreign Allen Industry. Yes, correct. Thank you. Now, your OS will be booting from an SD card. I want to go ahead and make a couple of people aware of things. Most SD cards will work. You may have an issue if you try to use a six year old card that's been in your theater or in your picture camera and you've used it a lot. It's because it's been worn down. You go out and get a new car, you do not have to get a top of the line UHC class 10 64 gig car. You can happily run these on a 2 gig or a 4 gig car without any issues. You can run them on a class 6, a class 8, class 10, they all work. Class 4 might be a little slow and you notice the difference. Not that it won't work, but you'll notice it. If you run a brand new UHC class car. Before you come planning to any of the distributions, please make sure you have your updated firmware. They fix the problem. Let's go ahead and cover a couple of practical applications of using the Pi. Some of the things that I know are being done, and in my case, I'm doing a couple of these, is control your home through things like XN and Mr. House. You can post a personal VPN file and media server all through open source technologies. Easily gettable, easily configured, and well documented. You can create your own open source PBX using a package called Asterisk. That gives you a complete void and if you have the hardware, the ability to have complete analog phone lines all run through and managed by your Pi. You can play games. You can play Quake 3, which I'll demo for the people in the room. You can play, obviously, Mario. And there's actually a nifty project out there called the Pi Cave, and we'll cover that. And of course, you can use it for media consumption. Things like XBMC, AirPlay, and various other tools. And then, I know we've got a couple people in the audience. You can use it for the automation process for home and micro group. And we'll cover that one at the end. For the home automation, personally, I use X10 via USB. Sure, some people say that X10 is outdated tech or whatever, but they're easily available, they're cheap, and they work. And the tech around it has been sufficiently developed that we can all figure out how it works from the well-documented code and wikis. 
I have to use MoCAD, and I literally just tell that right to my box and go, turn on my living room light, and it's on. That's single socket command. There is also large repositories, things like Mr. House, which will allow you to use the serial or the USB and your web interface, scheduling, to interface into your thermostat, control that as well. And then, of course, there's Zigbee and XP <laughs> controllers, which will allow makers to create these that do that for them. There's various projects out there. I know I've seen them. I unfortunately do not have the links with me today. But look around, you'll find them. For the personal server, one, I often suggest get an open VPN package installed and properly configure it. There are multiple wikis out there. They're very straightforward. If you happen to be someone who actually uses Arch Linux ARM, don't be afraid to go to the mainline Arch Linux wiki because OpenVPN is the exact same configuration. SSH for console server for using things like Screen and Tmux. If you're not familiar with those, there's something I think you should read into. They allow you to have a shell that you keep open as if you were at a console, not a GUI, but at a console and running a program that you could leave running. And if you were to be disconnected, it would keep that program running for you in the background. So if you pop up and you're saying, I'm running an update, and for whatever reason your network connection gets cut off, it keeps running your update instead of cutting it off in the middle of it, because that can be bad. Then there is Samba and NFS for sharing files. Samba is Windows file sharing. The reason that one's there, primary, is because most people are familiar with that one, and it's going to be the most approachable, just looking at the market of home PCs. NFS is network file system. That can be used for the devices that speak NFS. It can be done on Windows. It's not that easy. But for Macs and for Linux users, it's a more direct interface for those. However, I will admit, it is more complicated to set up than Samba. Not horribly hard. Again, the wikis are there. They're well documented, quite doable. Have mini DLNA for media access. If you're not familiar with what that is, maybe you are familiar with your TV, DVD, Xbox, PS3. They can all consume the UPnP and DLNA content that is served by that program. You store the media on your Pi and you pull it up, and when you go to go to my media servers on these various devices, it pulls them right up because it detects it. And then you can stream your media directly. And of course, for those of us that want to play with a little web development but don't feel like having that $300 box that's chewing up $30 of electric every month, you can of course put Apache or Nginx and PHP, ASP, whatever you want on there. And of course, the nifty one is that you can use a nifty backend for this. I just got screen called. <laughs> <laughs> right now, the Myth TV front end is not ready for the time. It's possible in the future, but they have to work on a couple of things because they don't have the codex, as I was speaking to earlier, prepared to be used. Once those are in place, I believe the Myth TV front end will be a possible option and a very interesting option at that. In the meantime, you can use it as a storage backend. Moving on the asterisk. And this is an interesting one if you want to set up a phone system in your house, voicemail, etc., all internally controlled and routed. You can do it completely open sourced. No questions asked. It's all there, and you can read through and compile it yourself if you really want to. One of the nifty things that I've seen done is that you can take your Google Voice account and route calls made your VoIP phones through Google Voice. Now, if you don't have a voice VoIP capable phone, you do actually have the option to get adapters that will make it that way for you. 
So for those of us living in the US, as long as you're calling a US phone number, it's free over your internet connection. There are clients available to use asterisk as a VoIP for Apple, for Android, for Blackberry, Windows, Mac, Linux. They're all out there, and most of them have an open source version if you choose to use that. I have included on this slide also the link that you see there for asterisk.org. That takes you to the main page for the development. However, keep in mind, you will have to need to go to the forums and the support and the documentation to get to the actual open source code because they do support their development by having a commercial side. Games. This is something that every kid can get into. And every big kid can still get into because we all like to play them. There are classic emulators that are available for Linux. And because they're available for Linux, they're available on the Pi. Now, I'll admit, I said classic because this is not going to play your ripped PS3 game. It's not got power, OK? What that does cover, however, is the NES, the Game Boy, the Game Boy Advance, Super Nintendo, Commodore 64, all of these work. Now, an interesting part, for those of us who've been in the scene long enough and know what Risk OS is, that was recently ported to the Raspberry Pi, and because of that, all of the games available on Risk are also now available on the Pi. One of those being of historical importance is the game Elite. Now, the picture you see on the side is a picture that I pulled down from Pi K. What they've done is they've attached a very small TFT display. They've attached a couple of buttons through GPIO and a controller the same way. <coughs> Although that one might be I2C. I'm not sure. And they're selling kits so that you can create all that you need. They'll sell you all the parts, pre-cut, and ready to go. The only thing they won't sell you is the Pi itself. And then you put it together, you load it with every your choice of OS is, and configure the system to do what you want. Now, quick three. For those of us that are here, I happen to have that installed. Obviously, being an Arch Linux ARM developer, I'm running that. And we have that package right up. So it's as simple as running Pac-Man, Dash S, IOQuake 3. IOQuake 3 because that's the open source branch that was ported directly to the Pi. Now, for those of you watching at home, I apologize. The screen may not come up that great for you to be able to see it, but we will see what we can manage. Yeah, notice that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Now, there is a known issue on Arch Arm at the moment that happens to do with the plan. And that is, there is a problem with the most recent GLIPC in that the LDSO cache doesn't work, which means occasionally when something wants something that's outside of the standard library path, you have to tell it where it's at. And we've made upstream aware directly at the GLIPC development, and they're working on the patch. I do not have sound hooked up, but for those of you that are here, can everybody see this? Barely. Okay. As good as possible, considering we have to deal with the massive skylight. <laughs> now, the install does ask you for the CD key. It's really as simple as escape, because it's just like a demo set. Just pay for it. Use those keys. Now, anybody want to volunteer to play quick? 
This is working. It's working well. As you will see in a second, I actually have this background and I didn't get it, uh, considering I'm hooked up through uh, RCA. Uh, again, unfortunately, I apologize that you guys at home cannot see this. The frame rate on this, when you're playing over RCA, will actually run uh, approximately 45 to 48 FPS. At certain very busy times, it will not drop below 27 at most. So it's pretty straightforward, pretty smooth, considering you're running this at, we're going to have to up the HDMI, full blown 1080p. Oh, cheesy There's nothing to There is. Unfortunately, it will get destroyed. What he can see, though, you should be able to tell that that is quite smooth, yeah. considering. Yes, it is not running in the corner at the moment. If it is, it is off the edge of the visible screen. I saw 37 FPS. Yeah, we did have this test hooked up to a, a DVI monitor, and we were running at an average of 37. Yes. It ran between like 30 and 45. Yeah. So, <laughs> well within playable range. Yeah. That was yeah. Earlier. That was. Uh, yes, because it'll auto downsize. And, yeah. If you really want to play Quake Three over old school and go through RCA, yeah, it'll fly. <laughs> it'll work perfectly. Yeah. We're going to keep playing a little bit here. Really? And I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next page here. <laughs> for, for media consumption, there is an already packaged XBMC that you can load right on and off you go. Not much to configure other than load into the XBMC, tell it where all your stuff is at, if it's stored on the network somewhere else, or if it's stored on your SD card or USB. It'll fire right up, and it'll work. Uh, the other things that you can do with this is AirPlay and Squeezebox. If you don't know what Squeezebox is, it is uh, originally produced by Logitech, I believe, and it is a music streaming radio. It's a little radio you set on your desk, you give it a Wi-Fi connectivity, and there you go. You can just tell your PC to stream right to it. For AirPlay, who owns an Apple device? I know there's a bunch of you in the room, and I'm sure there's plenty more on the internet when you listen to this. You can set up the appropriate bits of Python and GStreamer and literally play straight to your Pi. Hook it up to your TV, hook it up to your audio, and play your iTunes, YouTube, etc. right on it. Again, the MIP TV back end. Again, the front end is not ready, but I covered that earlier. Another nifty piece is AirPrint and CloudPrint. Now, AirPrint, again, comes back to Apple. You have a couple of Python scripts, and you install the C Unix Printing subsystem, or CUPS, and then you configure that, and that Python script talks to that, and you can send AirPlay right over your phone, your tablet, etc., and to do that. For cloud print, that is Google's cloud printing service. There are some printers out there that do it directly. You can turn your Pi and be able to do it as well. Notice that I have to leave your PC and your Chrome up all the time to be able to print from when you're out on the road. Set it up, and you can print from your smartphone. Then you have the ability to use Pandora, Spotify, and I believe Slacker Radio as well. All of these options, again, 
let you stream from the internet out to your audio outputs. Another option is MPD, Music Player Demon. This one's nifty, and I'll let you all read the wiki articles, but you can use it for shoutcast streams, you can create shoutcast streams with it, you can control your entire remote playlist with MPD. I want to play something, I have my media, but I don't want to go over to the console and this guy and pick it out with a mouse and keyboard. Open up the cloud on your phone, change what's playing. Now, now we have the brew pie. This is an interesting project. This is made by, obviously, guys involved in the microbrew and finding out what they can do with the pie. They said, you know what? As a hardware hacker who's already trying to automate this stuff, this is really, really going to help me out. And they took a combination of the Raspberry Pi and Arduinos to be able to get to the analog I.O. And they created Brew Pie. Now, Brew Pie is a set of shields for Pi and Arduino and a set of controls, all of which are fully open source. So you can go out and you can make the boards, you can put them together yourself, load the software, and run it, and there you go. As it stands, it's possible to improve upon and scale this however you see fit. The options for accessibility and expandability are very high. One sample that's already in the project is the use of Google Docs to control the timings and variables for everything you need that's part of brewing. So, for example, if you need a certain amount of temp for a certain period for your specific match, you can set that in Google Docs, import that into the system, and it will control it for you. The science part of brewing. The pie acts as a control system, making the process highly repeatable. Like any computer, it will do exactly what you tell it. Unlike a human, however, it will do exactly what it told, you told it to, exactly when you told it to. In other words, don't blame the pie if you told it to cook the mash too long. <laughs> a bonus of this is a system like brew pie can take measurements at rates, intervals, and places you can't by hand because it's fully immersed in the system. Sorry for the feedback. They're not coming for me, and we're not burning anything down. <laughs> Just out there. So let me go check. Get them back. <laughs> what else are we going to do? To the art side of brewing, because brewing is not just science. It's an art. Now, you have to come up with your own recipes. The pie will not <coughs> for you. It's a machine, not a human. It doesn't know what we like. It doesn't have blue gene in it, so it can't figure it out either. You can, however, use other people's recipes, and because they are an automated set used with brew pie, you can then replicate it to a T if you have all the ingredients correct. With the brew pie, if you make the perfect beer, you can do it again, and again, and again, because it is highly repeatable process. That's the key thing about this. Because as an individual who has to handle all the different tools, and take all the measurements, if you miss cook your mash by 10 minutes, that's 10 minutes more than you should have had it on there for that perfect one you had last time. Now let me just go ahead and cover a couple of choice of operating systems, and I can easily answer any questions for those in the room that want to know more about the last topic. I'll cover the main ones that are out there right now. The primary one currently endorsed by the Raspberry Pi Foundation for most users to approach the system is Raspbian, which is Debian compiled <laughs> specifically for the Raspberry Pi. And now they did this because Debian has two kinds. They have the RML, which is version 5, and has no floating point. 
Oh, I'm sorry, version 4, that's 14. Woo! Okay. And then they have ARM HF. The HF stands for hard flow. Now, to do that, you have to have a floating point. But they chose, since version 6 didn't require you to implement the floating point, to do it only for version 7 and above. Because in version 7 and above, you have to have that as part of your implementation. So there was a gap. The Pi couldn't use all of its features because it has a floating point, it has a GPU, all of these things that the version 4 and 5 don't, unless they're specifically made that way. So that was made, and I apologize, I can't remember his name right now, specifically to bring DP into the Pi and make that available as an approachable system for the people that are not comfortable or familiar with some of the lower level distributions. The dark Raspberry Pi you see to the right of Raspbian, that is actually for the Adafruit distribution Occidentalis, I believe is how it's said, which is handy for the makers in the room. That's pre-integrated with a web IDE for you in Python with access to the GPIO libraries in Python and various other languages, which could be very handy for those of you that want to get on it and get working ASAP. Other options. Fedora was once there. I believe they still are. Uh, they were in the news and then trailed off, so I don't know exactly what happened. Recently, as I mentioned earlier, RiskOS was ported to the Pi. And of course, the distribution I work for, our feelings are. Now, for those of you in the room, after the talk, I'll show you why I run R and why I run Arch Linux R. It takes about six seconds. <laughs> or less. <laughs> but that pretty much concludes the general gist. And if anybody has any questions, now would be a great time to go ahead and cover those. So if anybody in the room, anybody on the Hangout, if we can just raise a question, we will get that sorted out. We're watching the RC channels too. Yes. If you're in, um, we're at least in Make LB. Are we in any other ones? Uh, I'm watching in High 76 and Taxpayer Charlotte. Okay. But we're in Make LB. We're in High 76 and Taxpayer Charlotte. Actually, I think I've got one. Yeah. Okay. Um, does the Pi have a safe example of microphone input? Can you input sound into the Pi to process? Very good question. Uh, the question. In case you guys didn't pick that, you, you may have, because this mic is awesome. Thank you very much for that. Is does the Pi have a mic input? Does it have an audio in? No. In hardware, it does not. However, because it's expandable, you can add that through various means, easiest, of course, being USB. But like I warned you before, please don't attach 15 USB devices and then tell me that your USB performance is bad. You attach 15 devices. Anybody else? Anyone? Uh, yes, sir. Um, you? Those of us who have like, little knowledge, like, is there any resources online to learn how to like modify this type of stuff? Sure. Uh, Adafruit actually has a great system. Go to learn.adafruit.com. They have that there. There are also multiple tutorials available that teach you how to interface with the various devices through the various additional pieces you can get, such as the OMX part, which breaks out the GTIO pins. This is a standard ribbon cable. You hook this into a breadboard, and then you have the breakout of all your pins. The Adafruit version is slightly different. They make it in a straight and a T connector. All of these are labeled so you know which pin is which without having to worry about it. And again, plop it right in. I have one of these for my son, eight years old, playing with LEDs. Took five minutes to learn. Sure. With GPS, I mean, can this handle like a GPS system? Oh, yeah. yeah, you can easily handle GPS. Like, you will need to add GPS hardware, yes. but you can easily handle it. Yes. You can do a regular serial. You can re come near the serial port on it, or you can just use the USB. Most of them just come up as a serial port. Right. And again, because there's SPI and I2C, you can use those as well. And talk to any of the hardware guys that we have in the room, and they will show you how to do it. Anybody else? 
Uh, would you recommend, or what district would you recommend if you're starting out on, say, the Raspberry Pi and you want to go to some of these newer boards that may have more power, but not nearly as popular as the same time? If, if you didn't have something as popular, one, Raspbian is not designed for some of the new ARM version 7 ports. You can use the Debian ARM hard float. There is an Ubuntu variant for very specific selection of boards. The broadest selection that I'm aware of at this time is on Arch Linux ARM. Thank you. Anybody else? Do we have any IRC questions? Okay. Well, then I thank you all for your time. And if you have any further questions, you know how to go out and get a hold of me. One, you can get a hold of me in the IRC channel for Arch Linux ARM. Make LV, Hive76, or Hackerspace Charlotte. You can get a hold of me through my email, jblum at archlinuxarm.org. And of course, you can hit me up on the Arch Linux Arm forums. Again, thank you for your time and watching. One last thing. Okay. Can you just do a reboot just to show how fast it is. Raspberry Pi with Arch Linux Arm installed. I think it may actually take them longer to get out of Quake 3. Yeah, <laughs> longer to get out of Quake 3. Uh, because I, I can't tell what's just taken on uh, each week here to make you Yeah, it doesn't work in the middle of a game, guys. Control in the middle. I'll too. Watch out. Now, you just click bottom left corner. Yeah, there it is. Okay. There sure. You got it. Yeah, yeah. So, for those of you that are in the room and can see this. <laughs> Alright, just hit the reboot. I just sent reboot and. Don't. Alright. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. We brought it. <laughs> 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 yeah, we did actually. Yeah. <laughs> we missed it. Projector switch back to my Chromebook and poof, it went bye bye. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you.